Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. A big thank you as well to all of our Patreon supporters for contributing to the work we do on our channel. More on how you can join our Patreon community at the end of this video. But today... Kelly and I are going to look at five rules changes in one D&D playtests that we think are worth implementing in your campaigns now and starting to use right away as we head into 2023. Now this video is ending off 2022, so we might see even more changes to the rules that we're talking about in further playtests, but these are ones that we actually think are great how they are, and we hope make it into the final version in the release in 2024. So let's get into the five rules that we've liked the most. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So kicking things off at first level, in D&D 1, characters are getting a feat at first level. And we've actually seen even Wizards of the Coast start to sneak this into their campaigns because in the Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen campaign, Characters also get to choose a feat at first level, and they actually get a bonus feat at fourth level as well. Now, in the Dragonlance campaign, it's a much more restricted list of feats characters can choose from compared to the roles in the D&D 1 playtest. This rule is very simple. Characters just get to pick a feat at level 1. It is slightly restricted, though, so you can't choose the full range of feats that are available to characters at all levels of play. I do think that this actually feeds into another rule that I actually enjoy, and that is the tiered feats. At certain levels, you get access to better feats. This is good, in my opinion, because it means that you can kind of separate the feats by their power levels, which we know that the feats are not all created mm. equally. Having the feat choice at level one, though, opens up a lot more customization for the characters that we're making. You get to pick your species, your class, your background, and now you also get to pick that added extra feature that is going to help amplify the story that you want to tell with your character. There's a lot of really excellent feat choices out there. There's a lot of very flavorful feat choices out there. And I just think that this helps kind of ground and cement the character concept that you're coming up with. I love feats and I think that uh, just having the availability to choose more of them is great for our games. The feats that characters can choose in one D&D include things like alert, magic initiate, tough, savage attacker, and skilled. But even we've seen feats like lucky, but in a revised version, been open to first level characters. So I do think the feats that are designated as first level feats generally tend to be the not super powerful ones, the ones that don't come with ability score increases. And so I could see just allowing my characters to do this going forward adding that first level feat to their character sheet uh, and just enjoying the benefits of, of, of that. I think that this has been a popular house rule for a lot of campaigns anyways. And I would even say that I might even consider retroactively applying it to characters in my current campaigns. Now, the, the next one that we come to is one that I actually had to come around to. At first, I was hesitant about the changes to the exhaustion mechanic. But the more that we talked about it, mm. the more that I realized that exhaustion is one of those things in D&D that I love. I love that it exists. I love playing with it in my games. But it goes from 0 to 100 pretty quick. Yes. One level of exhaustion isn't that bad. Two levels of exhaustion, you're already starting to hit, hit penalties that are basically taking the character out of the fight for the rest of the adventuring day. And by exhaustion level three and four, even though your character isn't dead yet, they are dead weight. Yeah, and I think that these changes to exhaustion will actually give DMs an avenue to use them more readily in their game. Mm -hmm. Anytime that your characters are entering a tough environment, climbing a mountain or going through a desert or, or any sort of daring maneuvers or fleeing or running or a chase scene, or there's so many ways that you can actually implement the rules of exhaustion to add another layer of challenge mm. to your campaign. And having more exhaustion levels, having this open up a bit more, just means that we can use it without fear of absolutely debilitating our characters. Yeah, and it's very easy to remember. Exhaustion now works as 10 levels, so you can track it with a D10. And that is just the penalty that you apply to your attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws. And it also reduces spellcasters saving throw DC. So spellcasters don't kind of get to weasel out of the negative effects of exhaustion. But it hits gradually. One or two levels of exhaustion are a minus one or minus two penalty, which, well, that sucks. It's not going to mean that your character is going to suddenly give up on the adventuring day and want to go home and go to bed. 
I could see characters starting to feel like they are too tired to continue around maybe three or four levels of exhaustion. But what's interesting about that is that your character can have three or four levels of exhaustion and still feel like you have a chance of making it home. And that's that's what I think is is great, is if you are doing something like a mountain climb where they have to get to the top and there's not really anywhere to camp along the way, having them have a combat when they're at three or four levels is going to be scary for them. And they get to decide, are we going to keep climbing this mountain or turn around? Well, they're halfway there. And if it was regular exhaustion, they'd hit yeah. that and be like, we got to backtrack. But now maybe they'll push on. So I also think that this is an opportunity to add a really cool house rule that has been brewing around in my mind from playing a couple other systems like Call of Cthulhu and Numenera that have a push mechanic for characters where if they fail a skill check, they can accept the cost to try again. And what if there was a rule that your character could voluntarily take a level of exhaustion to re-roll an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw? So you could take the gamble on a very important roll, but accept a long-term penalty for the rest of the adventuring day. I think that's great. Um, that's a house rule that's not part of the 1D&D &D yeah. package, but I think that's a cool extension yeah. of what we're seeing now with the changes to exhaustion. I also think that as a dungeon master, I can now use exhaustion as a consequence for failure on skill challenges, skill rolls. I can apply it to more monsters more readily without feeling like characters that get one or two levels of exhaustion are just going to give up. Because players, I think, will endure a little bit more with this, especially because the previous exhaustion rules came with speed and hit point penalties, and they don't anymore. So our next category concerns two really clever ways that characters use proficiency when working with tools and when helping each other out. The first is the interaction between tools and skill proficiency. So a small rule that was kind of tucked away in these packets was the tool proficiency bonus. This basically allows you to kind of separate the tool proficiency and your skill proficiency, and if both are relevant for a role, you basically get advantage. You can use both the tool proficiency and the skill proficiency to apply to whatever challenge you're facing. And I think that one thing that we've talked about a lot is uh, the availability of tools and how they're implemented in our games. And I feel like this just makes a stronger case for having cool tool proficiencies. Yeah, so I think a couple interesting examples of where you would apply this rule would be a character who is proficient with a climber's kits or... Uh, um, so I think a cool example of where you might apply this rule is, for example, a character that is proficient with land vehicles but also animal handling could be a really good chariot driver. A character that is proficient perhaps with athletics and they're also proficient with climbing tools and that other type of equipment, they're a really good expert climber. A character who perhaps is proficient in a type of artisan's tools that is examining something that is related to perhaps arcana or history that is a constructed item to learn lore about how it functions. That's another place where you could apply it. So I think that there's interesting opportunities. Of course, as well, you could also argue for w ways that it could apply for thieves tools with dexterity. You could also argue for other ways that it could apply with a couple more niche things like perhaps um, investigation or perception checks when you're using things like um, investigators tools or other implements like that. I really like it and I like this synergy that it brings. Does this also apply to things like a performance check with your proficiency in a in a instrument? I wonder if it does. That would seem to be double dipping to me. Yeah. That's a little bit of a double dip, but maybe? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if instruments fall under tools in this ex example. So that's, that's kind yeah. of where I'm like, hmm, but maybe. Our next example is how the help action now integrates with your skill proficiency. Uh, Previously, you could take the help action and allow advantage on somebody else's role that they were doing on their turn. But now, this is a house rule that a lot of people have been implementing for a long time, and I actually really like this. In order to help somebody out, you need to have proficiency in the skill you're going to use to help them. So that makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. If I 
am not good at athletics. How am I helping somebody be good at athletics? Now, the DM always still had final call on this stuff, but this just codifies and sets the expectation more clearly. If your character is not proficient in Arcana, they're not going to help the wizard figure out those magical runes. If your character is not proficient in acrobatics or athletics, you're not going to be able to help a party member pole vault over a wall by doing the kip-up sort of maneuver. If you're not proficient in investigation, you're not going to help Sherlock Holmes investigate the room. I, I think that it's just simple and it makes a lot of sense and I have zero issues with this. This this helps out at the table rather than somebody always being like, oh, I'll use the help action for whatever the other mm. person's doing. This time you, you have to think now about what your character's good at. And this really brings more of a collaborative nature in knowing who everybody's what everybody's strengths are. Yeah. The next rule that we think is worth implementing right now is a super easy one. And once again, I think of rule that a lot of people didn't even realize wasn't a rule. And that is dropping the requirement for a specific class feature in order to use ritual casting. So previously under the rules, if a spell had a ritual tag, your character needed to have the ritual caster class feature or feat to cast that spell as a ritual. What this meant was sorcerers, warlocks, paladins, rangers, eldritch knights, arcane tricksters, all of these classes could have spells that were ritual spells on their class list, but they couldn't cast them as rituals. For the most part, rituals make sense to me when you're using them outside of combat to do something for exploration, protection, anything like that. They're, they're very handy spells to have in your arsenal and you still have to choose to put them in your arsenal. But I think that by rewarding players for packing these spells along on their adventure and giving them the opportunity to use them to great effect outside of combat when they have time to perform a ritual, it just opens it up in an interesting way that I think is going to let those other classes play around with these spells that don't break the game in any sort of way. These are spells that are just tools. It's like having extra tools at your disposal. Eldritch Knights and Arcane Tricksters, though, can now take Find Familiar and cast it as a ritual. Okay. Yeah, actually, that's okay. But but I think that that's the standard example for me. That's the standard example, yeah. and that's still not pushing the boundaries yeah. of the game, I don't think. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so at all. Um, so I, I think that it really just gives fantastic options for all characters to be able to do this, and it removes that weird, like... I think it. I always had to be reminded that sorcerers didn't have ritual casting. Yeah. Because I, I would forget that. So I think that a lot of people did use it. Use this rule. The last rule that we're looking at is the light weapon property changes that apply to two weapon fighting. And what's interesting is before they made this announcement of this rule change, we had talked about our own version of two weapon fighting in a video, and we had also talked to uh, Chris from Triant Monk's Temple about their video on on two weapon fighting and the changes yeah. that we would make and this is the exact change that chris suggested um we made a similar suggestion that was a little bit more powerful <laughs> uh so chris kudos to you for being bang on with this one and glad to see this rule implemented in the game yes i i think that this was a necessary change uh, because it just two weapon fighting was falling by the wayside and now it's a little bit easier basically the extra attack you get for two weapon fighting is now just part of the attack action which just opens this up for so many classes to benefit from two weapon fighting as an option for their fighting style this means that you don't have to spend your bonus action to attack a second time it's just part of having two weapons this is going to be really beneficial for monks who have a number of things to do with their bonus action your monks have flurry of blows you have step of the wind all of these tools at the monks disposal that they want their bonus actions for but it also didn't make sense to me that monks couldn't wield two weapons that feels very monk -like. this is actually a literal damage increase for monks because they can they can wield two short swords as monk weapons get that extra little d6 damage that extra opportunity to uh, apply stunning strike if they want to and still use their flurry of blows bonus at action attacks this also applies to rogues who now can make two attacks on their turn doubling their chance of landing sneak attack but also still opening up the option for cunning action yeah so this is going to be really beneficial for rogues and rangers have always been really good with two weapon fighting it's it's kind of one of the rare classes that i'm like ah two weapon fighting on a ranger but now it's even easier because 
certain rangers. Beastmasters and Drake Wardens definitely want their bonus action open, and so being able to be a, a two-weapon fighter and have your companion with you and being able to control them and command them is really beneficial. There are several ranger classes that are going to benefit from two-weapon fighting. I think most notably it means that you can fire down Hunter's Mark and start the two-weapon fighting right away. So this is really great for rangers that want a two-weapon fight and get that extra damage from Hunter's Mark. I think it's it's really, really elegant in the way that all that works together. It feels the way that it always should have. You still don't get to apply the extra damage from your ability score to that damage roll, but it still evens things out. This is also really awesome too, because there's a subtle change to equipping weapons in the one d d playtest packet where now you can equip or unequip a weapon before or after every attack you make as part of the attack action. So you actually don't need the two weapon fighting feat to draw two weapons and attack with both of them because the this new wording means you can draw your first weapon, attack, draw your second weapon, attack. Still, technically speaking, you have to have the other weapon in your offhand at the time you make the attack with your main hand to trigger two weapon fighting. So it doesn't quite work this way, but I would let it work this way. I would do it. <laughs> I, I do think that that subtle small change to the equipping weapons is also really yeah. beneficial and something that we've wanted to see here for a while. We've said it so many times that like switching from your sword to your bow is complicated <sighs> when it shouldn't be. Yeah, you should. And now it's not. You should just be able to like switch things out like the weapon swap stuff and the handedness thing is such a weird bookkeeping thing and even this change doesn't fully address it like it still doesn't make it smooth by the way the rules are written to switch from say a long sword and shield to a bow it still might require actions somewhere or dropping your weapons rather than putting them away i just think again hopefully this gets smoothed out even more but i would start using it as is all in all, we've heard a lot of comments about 1D&D, &D, and I will say that the things that we haven't liked are the things that most people are talking about. But I think that it's important that we look at some of the smaller details in these packages that are actually smoothing out and improving things that we've wanted from this game for a long time. We're still in the playtest phase, but these are rules that I really hope stay true and see their way through to the final version of 1D&D. At the same time, there's a couple rules changes that we're not too thrilled about, and hopefully those continue to get smoothed out in future iterations. I think we've seen a lot of other things, like for example, in the most recent playtest packet, the improvements to the study, search, and interaction actions um, really were a big step forward after that. As of the most recent playtest packet, we still got some clunky things with hiding. We still got some clunky things with movement modes. We still got some clunky things with a couple things involving rests, but hopefully we get we get into smooth water soon. So if you've been enjoying the playtest packets for 1 D&D &D or have thoughts on these specific rules or other rules, let us know about them in the comments below. The videos we created on our channel are made possible with the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider becoming a patron of our channel by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more great commentary on 1D&D right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.